Hello everybody, it's Dr. Boz. We are here Tuesday on the live show. Welcome for those of you that are uh, catching us for the first time. Uh, typically I open with a quick prick of my finger and tell you what my ketones and glucose are, but today we are gonna be talking all about glucose and it's continuous monitoring, what that means, what I've learned as I watch patients, what is learned as I watch myself. Uh, so I figured another glucose prick was not necessary for today. You know, I get a lot of folks writing in saying, you know, Dr. Boss, why do you fast every week? And I have different answers for different weeks, but typically it's, I'm looking to ignite that autophagy, stimulate my metabolism, trade over some of those weakened mitochondria for some better ones. I'm also looking to keep the weight down and I have a pretty busy life that uh, sometimes doesn't follow all the rules that I tell you guys to follow but it does uh, seem to be manageable if I have that uh, weekly fast. And in, on this channel, we don't say the word fasting until you get to at least 36 hours. I fast somewhere around 60 to 72 hours every week, um, closer to 60 than to 72 most weeks. But it's an incredible uh, stimulus for uh, watching how well my metabolism uh, flexes or switches from ketones to glucose and yeah, it does what I ask it to do. So as I have looked at um, some of the most powerful tools in what keeps me fasting, because I've been doing this a while, like I think nine, eight, eight or nine years I've been doing fasting, routinely fasting at, uh, every week, probably not pushing it to 60 hours until um, the last five years, but so a significant amount of time, and it can get boring. <laughs> like, why am I doing this? What's the point of this? It wasn't until I started wearing this continuous glucose monitor that I got a lot better insight into what happens during life. So I have some patient examples tonight of what has happened with stories uh, of patients, what they were doing when they were wearing these continuous glucose monitors, what I learned about them, and some of them, um, what they learned about you. Uh, I mean, what, uh, what they learned about themselves, excuse me. So as I uh, do this, I do want you putting your questions in the chat. I have some uh, helpers that are looking at your questions. I'm hoping your questions are about wearing a continuous glucose monitor or the curiosity behind it. Or if I start to talk about things that um, I might not have cared about in the past, but I do care about now, I wonder if that's gonna spark some curiosity. So let's dive right in. We're gonna start with a couple of patient stories of some of a younger patients. And by that, I mean in the 30s. Um, of somebody who really did a good job of <laughs> being brave enough to wear her continuous glucose monitor, share the data with me, and then tell me the stories behind why it's not looking so perfect. All right, so let's hop over to the slides. Here are two slides, and I think I can draw on my, um, on my slide here. Um, uh, so yeah, okay, uh, everything's working like it's supposed to. All right, so let's look at this top uh, example here. Um, when you look at um, the timeline here, it starts at 12 o'clock midnight there, there's 12 o'clock noon, and then here's 12 o'clock midnight. So as I look, you look at this chart, just kind of frame that work uh, or that area um, during that time. So obviously she's sleeping during this early part right here. Somewhere around here, she says she woke up around uh, she thought it was around 6.30. You can see a little bit of a, of a dip there in that uh, area. Oops, I don't want to do that. Uh, you can blow up some of these and you can't blow up some of these. So I was trying to pinch that. It didn't work. Um, but what happened here uh, is she ate the same meal twice. Uh, the first time she ate this meal, it was actually a, um, it was a bunch of pasta. <laughs> so she's like, in the name of science, uh, I'm eating some pasta. But the first time she ate, um, she was sick. And if you can notice that, that the amount of pasta she said was about the same, uh, it's clearly about the same time of night, um, of evening when she was eating, but look at how much uh, longer it took to get that, uh, that glucose back down when she was not feeling well. And also, uh, if, you, if I would follow this chart into the next couple of days, she said that she really never got much below 100 until almost three o'clock in the morning. So let's just uh, pull this out of there so you can see that curve again. So as she e eats the meal right here, shoots that glucose well up to that, um, you know, here's 162 is where that um, meter is. And, and it really doesn't get back below, um, 
I mean, it doesn't get back to the 100 area for almost, um, yeah, maybe two and almost three hours. And then it really stays close to that 100 area until about three o'clock in the morning. Now let's compare that to the same meal that she ate. It was, I think it was a week or two later. Uh, again, in the name of science, having all that pasta, uh, pretty good control of bl blood glucose before eating. And then a rather nice spike and then drop, well, not quite that low, uh, of a blood glucose. So area under the curve is really what we're looking for when people are uh, metabolizing that glucose that um, I've not only seen this in her uh, data, but several times as patients come in uh, and we look at this together, they'll say, you know, they'll look at the height that it got to and then they'll look at what their average is. But uh, one way of assessing whether or not that insulin resistance or that ability to control glucose is as tight as you'd want it to be uh, in the way you're aging is once you put that glucose high, how long does it take to rope it back down? So as you can see in that, uh, in that situation, it really was uh, a much different scenario when she wasn't feeling well, particularly middle of the night. I think it, you know, if I look at the most powerful, uh, teachable moment when people are wearing continuous glucose monitors, it's the stuff that's hidden to them, hidden to me, uh, and only after they've been studying that, um, that, um, that, uh, you know, their own data, are they able to say, oh my goodness, look what happened. All right, here's a great example also, same client, same person who 12 o'clock in the morning, there is midnight, here is noon, and uh, <laughs> she said she woke up uh, and had some pastries. Uh, these pastries are not typically on her list, but uh, I think the height of this was, uh, I mean, it was almost like 210, was how high that glucose went when she was you know, for after one pastry. She's like, I wasn't even gluttonous, I just had one. Uh, what she did after that was, she said, I was so alarmed by how high that glucose went that uh, she went for a run for about an hour after she got home. So if, if here's the time home, um, maybe that's the run where you can see it's a little bit higher of a glucose as she's exercising. And then that glucose is able to get a lot closer back down to baseline. Had she not exercised after eating like that, I have seen a pastry, especially in an insulin resistant patient, send that glucose to a height that's, you know, north of 200 and they really do not uh, have it returned to, well, it looks much like the one on the bottom was. Same patient where she went out to eat, and this time I actually wrote down what she ate so I could uh, remember it. it. It was Chinese food. Uh, she tried eating, <laughs> she said, I tried eating low carb. There was some soup, so I had that, but I also had breaded chicken with the soup, and there were some noodles in the soup. Uh, there <laughs> was some free dumplings, so because they were free, of course I ate them. Uh, and this is the worst reaction to food that she had seen with her CGM. It did not normalize until three o'clock in the morning. She said that what really happened with Chinese food, and I think many of us can relate to this, is uh, the volume of food that she ate was much higher than she predicted. Again, that blood sugar staying really pretty high, uh, peaking out at that 217, uh, well above 180 and uh, not not getting back down. She said she did not sleep that well that night. Chinese food turns out not to be <laughs> her uh, best antidote for um, insomnia. <laughs> I mean, it's an antidote for, it's not an antidote for insomnia. Uh, we're gonna do the last one, which is a different client doing some uh, fasting, and then during the fasting, she uh, hopped into the sauna. I get this question a lot as patients say, what happens when you go in the, into the sauna or when they work out? Uh, or more importantly, if they're wearing a CGM, they'll say, hey, I went into uh, my workout and my blood sugars went up. I wonder if I should stop exercising because it's gonna change my average blood sugar uh, to higher with that high of a spike in my sugar. And I would say, well, first of all, that's absolutely backwards thinking. Let me show you about this blood sugar. So here again, we have nine o'clock in the morning. Here's noon uh, and then 6 p.m. Getting in that sauna at about 6, 10 or so. She's in there for about 20 minutes. The spike of her blood sugar did go up to about 130, 135. This was again 130. Uh, and she just didn't wait for it to go back down before she took that um, screenshot. Uh, but it would have looked much similar to this where it spikes and then valleys, spikes and then valleys. Notice how much different that is than the shape that happened when they ate something. So I'll just use uh, this area. If you 
if that spike happens when they eat something, that blood sugar can take a while to get back down. Whereas opposed to exercise, it enters the circulation. Uh, I'll do it over here. It enters the circulation and then that glucose goes right back down. Again, every time your um, your system, I mean, every minute of every day, your liver is exiting some glucose into circulation. That's how our glucose stays um, stable. That when you have a, a exposure to heat, uh, that's one way to do this, where your body gets exposed to heat, the mitochondria inside those muscle cells are in charge of, uh, of, of dealing with the heat, of processing the heat. If you do not process that heat, you will die. It is a workout for your mitochondria to handle the heat and you know, spin that energy through the, um, through the body and have a different, um, you know, you're sweating. The one way you'll see that on uh, the outside of uh, their body, but you'll also be able to watch to see, yes, that glucose and circulation is moving energy and the specific energy is the mobilization of glucose from the muscle cells. So exercise does that, as does the exposure to the sauna. And the, the spike in valley of a sauna-induced or exercise-induced glucose mobilization is actually a very important and healthy uh, metric to have in, um, in our bodies. What I think is interesting is how that affects people differently. So when I look at several of uh, folks who've had an exercise schedule, first the first one in many years, you can see a much higher response of glucose those first few times they exercise. And you say, well, why would that be? In, in many ways, that mobilization of, of stored glycogen in your muscle cells, the stored glucose in your muscle cells, does not get mobilized unless you use the muscle. Uh, so when you ha hear people saying, yeah, I'm fasting, like what I do every week, I'm fasting and I'm you know, trying to burn up all that glycogen or that stored glucose, uh, the, the rest of that sentence needs to say, in your liver, not the, the glucose stored in the muscle cells. There, the amount of glucose stored in your liver is much smaller than what is stored in your muscle cells, surely because of the amount of mass the amount of cells that are muscle cells in the body and the amount of cells that are present in the liver. I suppose you can have a liver large enough to compete with muscle cells, but it would be um, a very, very, very <laughs> uh, large liver. So let's pretend I didn't say that out loud. It, the liver is always about one third of the glucose storage, whereas the uh, maybe one fourth of the glucose storage, depending on body size, and the muscle cells are storing about two thirds to three fourths of that stored glycogen. All right, we're gonna go to a, a different uh, area of, um, um, just this is like what I, this is actually somebody's synchronized data. Um, a little easier to watch, a little easier for me to explain. Let's see if I can, um, yes, this is what I want. Okay, so here is, uh, behold still with that. Uh, that's not what I wanted to move. I wanted to move this one. Um, we're gonna go to, okay, I guess I'll hold it just right there. Uh, with the, with the, uh, this, oh, here we go. That's where I was, okay. you can see in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, we've got, as I uh, pull that uh, cursor over the continuous glucose monitor, uh, I'm able to see what those blood sugars are doing. So I think I just got to figure out how to steer ah, in a way that doesn't <laughs> do what I just did there. I want to make it a little bit small. I guess that's not going to go smaller. Uh, all right, so we're looking at blood sugars over here on the edge. I was just was trying to show you the metric. That yellow line uh, is really just about 180. So as I pull back over, you'll see the distance from there. I want to point out that at midnight, how high this blood sugar is going. So this is what it looks like when continuous glucose monitors are hooked up to the clinic. You can see that's the name of our clinic. That's you know the provider associated with the patient, um, and you know you see this. Uh, you know, this midnight or 12 a.m. the night before, blood sugar is about 112. We go to um, the, the end of this day and that blood sugar is at about 166. So something is happening here. Bedtime for uh, this patient is around between 
10, 10.30. Uh, and as she's sleeping, something dangerous is happening here. Some, a spike of blood sugar. I mean, you could say, oh, she's eating in bed. No, she's well, it's not eating in bed. And you can see there's uh, not a large spike of, from her meal here. So this is when she eats. She usually eats in that uh, two to three hour period somewhere between noon and uh, you know, tries to be done eating by four o'clock. So here's when that food is going in and that is not a very high spike of, of glucose. So let's, uh, let's go to the next day. So here she went to sleep and now again, that midnight, 160 blood sugar uh, at midnight, finally coming back down below that um, you know, 150 mark by you know, one o'clock in the morning or you know, getting, I guess, 12 o'clock in the morning. So that spike is very unusual. It does peak out pretty high, um, and, but then it stabilizes. And so at first I thought I knew what this was. Um, she wakes up around that 5.30, 6 o'clock time. So here's where her body's just waking up. Just as just a uh, different uh, glucose stimulus. Um, uh, somebody wrote in, could the spike be meds at the middle of the night? Let's just hang tight and look at this a little closer. Uh, again, here is a more, uh, a higher glycemic response to the meal she's eating. Uh, again, probably didn't eat around till somewhere around here, so ate a little earlier in the day. Um, and then might have had another uh, bite of food, you know, some sort of food here. Um, now you've got six o'clock where she says, I, I'm not eating this late at night. Now, uh, this time she didn't have that big spike in the middle of the night. Let's go to a couple more days before you, we start to say, what could that be? Now, could she have had a few you know, bites of food here causing these spikes? You know, that's based on a history and I, I, don't, I don't know if I have the history exactly right for February 21st of last week or last month. Um, so let's go to the next day. So here again, midnight, she's at 120. Uh, we would like that to not be that high um, and in the middle of the night, her liver is emptying. That glycogen storage, the one that was emptying from those muscle cells of the one who was in the sauna. Uh, uh, the, also the glycogen that's being emptied from muscle cells of somebody who's exercising while fasting. Uh, remember the gal who had the Chinese or the pastry and said, I went for a run right afterwards. Essentially, any of that glucose that was going into storage from the pastry is what she was burning before it ever really went into storage. She might have had a little trade from storage back into the, um, back into the um, uh, circulation, but pretty much a net negative because she went running for an hour after she had that pastry. So here, obviously three o'clock in the morning, she should be sleeping, 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 sleeping. Somewhere around six o'clock is when she wakes up. Probably this little spike right here is when she's waking up. Uh, this cortisol rise right here is her body giving an, a, a signal to wake up and then she's probably actually moving right around that 6.30 time, um, you know, a little bit after that. So now stable, do, doing life, doing whatever morning routine happens. Lunchtime, didn't eat there, you can see that. And now had something to eat right there about 12 or two o'clock, that'd be, or almost just before two o'clock. Uh, and then probably didn't eat much after that. Again, this patient is trying to lose weight. She is trying to improve her metabolism. So most of the time she's following the rules. Eight o'clock at night, she might have had a snack there that, uh, I mean, that's what it looks like is a common time where I would be putting in a snack. That's my downfall too. And then she's preparing for bed. Now, either she is a terrible sleeper. <laughs> this, what's alarming about here, this is uh, this, when that sugar goes up, there's a couple more examples of this I want to go through before I start to put my theories in place here. So here again, she wakes up midnight, now she's down to that about 100. We love to see that glucose get below 100 before she wakes up in the morning. Um, here's that waking up right in there. So now just about to hit uh, double digits, but really only gets down to 101 unless I didn't quite find it. Again, there's that, uh, that meals that are being starting around maybe there and she's eating really low glycemic index foods. And then she spikes back up to over 200 for something around 9.30. This, I'm gonna guess, has gotta be a snack. I don't think she's sleeping yet at this point. Um, but when that sugar goes high, look at the plummet she has from that, um, 
that glucose. So this is the part where I'm going to spend just a little bit more time uh, really uh, outlining what happened here. So as she put food in and her system hasn't been stressing uh, the production of insulin, meaning she is eating lots of low glycemic index, we are trying to empty glycogen, get that blood sugar low enough, decrease the stimulus for producing insulin, and then she eats something that really pushes that blood sugar north of 200, uh, only to be followed by um, a pretty, pretty low number in her, let's see if I can get it to tell us the lowest. Uh, so for her, it's in double digits, it's in the 97s, but it's really that change from 200 to 100 that says this is a response to eating and her body is overproducing insulin. This is a common thing that I uh, will see when patients are in transition from, you know, they, they learn how to eat a ketogenic diet, they are trying to reverse some of these chronic medical problems, they have been producing extra buckets of insulin. Every time they eat, their insulin is produce, produced in excess. That is what insulin resistance is, is the amount of insulin it takes to move glucose from the blood sugar into the cell is excessive. As they start to decrease the amount of carbohydrates they eat, their blood sugar comes down. Relative from what it was before the ketogenic diet, maybe their blood sugars were running in the 150s, and you can see with this example, they're now running in that um, you know, 120, 110s, 110s, we're getting closer to double digits. She was really trying to hold on tight. It, as she does that day after day after day, her beta cells, those cells inside the pancreas that produce insulin, well, they're getting used to this. They're saying, I don't need to produce as much insulin, that blood sugar is lower. And at first, her cells kind of riot, <laughs> they boycott, like, hey, I need some sugar, I need some glucose. And it's gonna take a higher amount of insulin to get the glucose inside the cell, so they're, so inside the cell, those those mitochondria are starving. Those cells are saying, where the heck is my good sugar? I've been living off this forever. But it takes this higher amount of insulin that she's been producing for weeks, months, maybe years, that she just now lowered with a lower amount of insulin. Guess what? The cell is uh, deprived of the recent amount of glucose it used to have. So as she's acclimating to, to that, as she is you know, getting her body used to that lower insulin, those cells, uh, we'll put out a, a APB that they want some ketones. If we were checking continuous ketone meters at the same time, we would see that plunge of, um, of ketones uh, get higher and higher with each kind of stimulus that she gives uh, of, her, of, her, of her metabolism. So most of the time you see her story that uh, she's trying to keep that eating window nice and tight. I don't have any documentation of where the exercise was happening, so maybe she hasn't quite added that yet, which is what I would recommend, really getting that eating pattern down nice and stable. And then it looks like she relapsed. She had more carbs than she was used to. And let me just go back to that because I think it's a really good teaching moment here. So here she has this, um, you know, blood sugars in the, um, afternoon, evening, doing pretty good. She's been, you know, if we go back, like you saw three or four or five, six, you know, now we're in like week six of this and she's doing a nice stable job and then carbohydrates go in. And as they, uh, the amount of insulin needed to control this high of sugar, this amount of glucose, uh, well, the beta cells are sitting there with that memory of how to make that much insulin. That's what she's done for the last, you know, let's say 12 months. As her uh, production of insulin now is in excess, uh, it plummets that blood sugar really quickly. I bet she feels really tired during that time where from that 950 uh, to you know, 1030, is, as that blood sugar drop just plummets, you will see um, that uh, it's a response of excessive insulin produced because of the path that she's on to get lower amounts of insulin, to reverse insulin resistance, to lower those blood sugars. And it just gives uh, the insight on how difficult it is that once patients have insulin resistant, we need weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of lower blood sugars, then lower blood sugars, then lower blood sugars. Uh, people say, how can you do that faster? And you're like, well, the first thing that has to happen is your body has to have that stimulus to make uh, ketones in excess. And you can see that she does that. When she puts in uh, her low glycemic foods you know, earlier in those uh, profiles, they really do a good job of um, 
I mean, you can really see a good job of keeping that blood sugar pretty much where it's been. 20 points is a, is a big spike for her on her in her eating window. And then she eats something that probably tasted really good. <laughs> and it was a relapse. It was a bunch of, you know, stimulus of carbs and her body overshot. Um, and boy, do I see that pattern a lot. I'm going to move on to a different patient. So while I do this, I just am going to... Um, uh, hold on one second. I got to click and then click uh, and put uh, sign in. I knew that was going to happen. Um, hang tight, hang tight. I'm getting there. Uh, okay, and let's do pretty. Do okay, so let's do. Here we go. All right, so now I have another another client that I'm going to show you, and this is another typical problem that I see um, when pa patients have been on a ketogenic diet. This client has. Um, all right, so actually, I want to put the chat on so you guys can see what questions are coming in. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to explain this patient's uh, story. Uh, they've been ketogenic for a while. Um, actually, uh, I think. Uh, Oh, I clicked on mine. All right, so we're gonna see my numbers, um, which actually has a similar pattern. I was like, oh, it looks just like that other patient. Uh, so I'm gonna go back um, to, it's not quite as filled in as the other ones. Well, let us let me show you how this looks. This is the event from uh, the middle of the night last night, and I will go to the, let's go over here uh, and show you what happened. Um, this is from yesterday, so let's go back to here. All right, so this was yesterday, and uh, this is 6 p.m. when I put in that new, uh, uh, my CGM ran out, and then I just put in a new one yesterday. But I'll tell you that I was not, it was not my perfect fast. You, you guys know that I like to fast every week, and this past week, I did a show last week about how terrible I felt. Uh, I actually, the day after I did that live, I, I did that interview late at night that I had told several of you I was gonna do, um, which went great. Uh, I think it is going to air on their show in the next week and a half. That is, uh, the, uh, Dr. McCullough interviewed me. Um, but I pushed it too hard. I pushed it way too hard. I should have gone to home. My, I could feel my throat uh, tightening and really getting scratchy by the end of that interview. It is way past my typical like functional time. I, the interview didn't start until eight o'clock my, uh, my time. So it's nine o'clock. I'm super tired. I can feel the heaviness of an infection. That's just, I should not have done that. The next day I spent in bed. I mean, Actually, I, we have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber at our house. I didn't even, I went in there for like five hours. And usually when someone in our family is using that hyperbaric oxygen chamber during a time of sickness, or if you know one of the kids has a um, sinus infection, or if you know they're recovering from a major workout, uh, the first question we ask one another as we've been in the chamber is, well, how long till you had to pee? Again, under that pressure, just like if you went scuba diving, you would have pressure from the water. This is pressure from air, and it really does ring out inflammation. But I was so dehydrated. I think I was in there six hours. I fell asleep. I mean, just boom, out. And I did not have to pee when I got out at six hours. <laughs> like, that's naughty. I was way too dehydrated. I pushed way too hard. And my sugars didn't do anything nice. <laughs> I spent the rest of the day in bed. Uh, I, I think I fell asleep at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in my own bed and didn't wake up until 5 o'clock the next morning. So again, um, I've been sick is what I'm trying to show you as I show you these numbers. Uh, the weekend goes by. There's a, you know, I'm feeling better. The cough is a little less. But let me show you um, as I got home yesterday. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, as I got home yesterday uh, from the office, I... I, I wasn't feeling good. Um, this is me fasted uh, over 24 hours, but at this point, 6 p.m. And about here is where I had a couple bites of, must have been here. That must have been right before where I had that. Boy, that's really late. I wonder if I did that. Um, well, I thought it was around eight o'clock that I had a couple bites of sardines. Uh, I had a couple of fillets of sardines and just said, it's not the perfect fast. I don't feel that great. Um, but um, look what happens after that. So I'm in bed somewhere around probably 9.30 and the blood sugar is still triple digits and then uh, sneaks down to, 
Let's see what's the lowest there. Ooh, come on, come on, come on, come on. It must have been, 50, I think it was 54. So again, that's pretty, it's not quite the lowest, but that's, uh, that's a pretty low number. I think maybe I just have to make it smaller. Why won't it let me control that better? Oh, there you go, yeah, oh, 43. So pretty low blood sugar, even for me. Uh, as I say, boy, I, I just wasn't feeling good. Um, I probably shouldn't have fasted uh, that yesterday. You know, I was just not feeling good. And I'm not as good at listening to my body as I should. <laughs> so there's midnight, it did spike back up. The body um, mobilizing a stress response was done to get that back up. But I also have, was pr probably producing a pretty good amount of ketones. If I had a continuous ketone meter on at that point, you would see it. But now it's midnight and look what happens after midnight. So there's midnight, 83. And again, that sinks down to below, I think under 40 is what low is. So that's by 1230. Um, again, um, 44 and then 61. Now, I'm not trying to show you that this is healthy. I'm not eating at all here. Um, I wake up at about um, five or four, but just like about five o'clock is when I wake up. So already triple digits. Um, and then my workout starts at 5.30. So at, by the time I get to my workout, my blood sugar is 109. And then I, I, <laughs> I mean, I did my, my workout. And here's what happened on my day today, which was not fair, but this is, this is what, uh, here's life. Um, I wasn't planning on showing you this, but I, I'll just tell you the story of why, what the heck happened that my blood sugar went up to 163. So I went, at, at, as I'm finishing up my workout, I order Starbucks and I uh, usually have an Americano, a black Americano when I'm uh, on a fasted day and I'm gonna put salt in it. But I get to the window, I have a meeting that I need to get to by about 7.15 and as I drive away from the window, it's not my coffee. <laughs> this coffee tastes funny. <laughs> this coffee has a sweetness to it. Uh, and I stop and look and it's got some lavender thing. It did have heavy cream, so that was lucky for me. Uh, but it was, um, there was some sort of powder that was put in it. And I didn't have time to turn around. And by now I've already broken my dang fast. I mean, I've already got the sugar in and I can feel it. I feel good. <laughs> I feel like, woo, we are having a party there. But for the whole uh, next several hours, it takes um, before I finally get that blood sugar down. Now, I'll tell you, I calibrated right here at 1030 in the morning that, again, this is a new CGM, so I have to usually calibrate it. It was about 20 points off. Uh, from that so you could probably say that maybe that was 143 because that was the first time I calibrated which makes me concerned like what was my blood sugar really in the middle of the night all right so the point isn't just to overly dissect what happened to me but is to say w when people write in they ask why do those blood sugars go that low in the morning uh, in the middle of the night this is actually what should be happening. You should be emptying your liver while you sleep. You should have uh, that movement of glycogen, that emptying of glycogen overnight. And for the longest time when I would wake up in the morning and check my blood sugar first thing in the morning, I mean, first thing in the morning for me is usually 530. I mean, it's already right on the edge of 100. And again, I wasn't eating here. This is my, my, you know, glucose, my liver did empty, that glycogen did empty, and that steady rise of blood sugar as my body wakes up. Uh, it, it's, it is um, this process uh, that really does blow your mind when you start studying yourself. When I look at, um, I had a couple of questions, uh, I might not have been on the recording when I was talking to Dr. McCullough about what is some of the most pivotal things you've seen in uh, improving people's uh, metabolic health. And I will tell you, I don't, I, I think it's a sin <laughs> when patients come to me and say, here doc, here's my problem. Will you fix it? I don't think that's what a medicine was ever meant to be. I think medicine was meant to be, I, ha as the clinicians, as the providers, we study medicine and then we study humans. And we're supposed to put those two, uh, two rich uh, topics together and say, here's what I think is happening. Here are the steps you're gonna need to do to improve it. Meaning I'm supposed to hand back that problem to you and you are supposed to own the problem. In the world of, you know, prescriptions are, are regulated by physicians and providers that patients come to these office visits with this laundry list of things saying, doc, fix it. And the number of um, people expecting that 
to be a prescription, expecting that to be a, here's the steps that I will tell you to do and then you'll get better. Well, I'll, I'll say they don't get better. It is only when that the ownership of the problem, the really the understanding of the problem awakens inside a patient's mind that we start to say, oh my gosh, we're on the path to, to recovery, to better health. And there is nothing faster than the recovery that happens in a, um, in a patient who's not just healthcare has been uh, hidden behind continuous glucose monitoring, but that, con that, that grind of chronic stress. Um, like the, the patient who's trying to lose weight, who's got those you know, blood sugars uh, shooting north of 200 near midnight, you know, you look at what, you know, is there some magical thing? Is it diabetes that she's, no, she doesn't have diabetes, right? Once he's not that terrible, like in the mid fives, you know, 5.4-ish. And, and you say, well, what could be um, the most important thing for her to learn? Uh, what, what is she discovering as you look at that continuous glucose monitors? It, uh, it is what the chronic grind of low sleep or interrupted sleep or evening eating does uh, to launch those sugars higher and then to get higher and then to get higher. Uh, the first, uh, I didn't uh, have full closure when I saw that blood sugar in the middle of the night at midnight hitting uh, north of 200. And if I would have scrolled back a couple of weeks, that, that's happened like four or five times. I think it's sleep apnea. Um, I see that when patients stop breathing at night because their airway shuts down. Uh, and you'll see this stress response, and then they're, you know, it'll wake them up, just like a high blood sugar in the morning, about 50 in me, and then it trickles up. The higher that blood sugar gets, uh, the more my body will wake up. As I look at, um, uh, I mean, as her brain looks at that rise in blood sugar, it's because uh, there's a stress response going on, and um, because of not breathing. Then they'll shoot those blood sugars high. If she falls back asleep and either rolls on her side or, or I've got the diagnosis wrong, it's not sleep apnea. But that's what a pattern of sleep apnea looks like is that they'll go to sleep and that first deep wave of, of deep sleep correlates with high blood sugars and then uh, an awakening. If we were looking at heart rate, you'd probably see that heart rate get really high and then she breathes and then the blood uh, heart rate comes down and the blood glucose comes down. So when I look at the transference, number one, transference of ownership for a of what happens when people have a continuous glucose monitor, that would be the number one thing that I think most people finally see. Like the gal who went for a run after the pastry, she's like, typically, I would have had another one. It was great, it tasted awesome. The consequences of what that pastry was doing, even at her young age of 35, uh, it really impacted her, it changed her behavior. But I'll tell you, in my case, what I do is um, I'm preparing for a couple of major lectures. I am actually uh, headed to, um, um, to Egypt to speak in um, Egypt over the next, uh, in the middle of April. Um, I will, let me just touch on Dr. Bob's favorites here. Uh, this is uh, again on my website. If you look at that keto oncologist, if you want to sign up to hear that lecture that does have uh, remote access, if you want a continuous glucose monitor, this is where Meaningful Medicine links you to that improved, um, just that process of getting you a prescription that would last you a year and how many times you fill it, what, how, many, how often you fill it is up to you, but then you have the prescription that would last you a year. Um, but one of, one of the things I have learned wearing my continuous glucose monitor is not just that um, what happens to my blood sugar when it goes high or what, when I eat certain things, but uh, this lecture that I'm preparing for KetoCon or uh, Hack Your Health, which is also down here somewhere on the favorites page. Yeah, there you go, Hack Your Health. And for the one uh, with, um, with Keto Oncologist is to look at uric acid. Uh, to, and really, I, I can't uh, express enough how much um, I've learned uh, about, well, fructose. And you say, oh, fructose, I don't, I don't eat that. That comes in high fructose corn syrup, and that's the most common place that you get it. Uh, and how much fructose is in that high fructose corn syrup is, you know, depending on which, which version of high fructose corn syrup they added to that uh, processed food. So you say, I am holier than thou, I don't eat high fructose corn syrup. Uh, but what is not commonly taught 
but it's very evident is that when your blood sugars reach a certain level, uh, they start to make fructose. Your body will take that glucose and turn it into fructose. Uh, and I thought that was something that only diabetics did. But as I am preparing for this lecture and studying this, uh, I knew that when your blood sugar would reach 200, that you were making it into fructose. That was very common. But what I have since learned is that th this is a spectrum, a pendulum, uh, and at 100, when your blood sugar is 100, you are not turning that into fructose. But when it gets to 120, especially inside the brain, when that blood sugar gets to above 120, your brain begins to turn glucose into fructose. And the next thing that fructose does is stimulate the production of uric acid, which is like a waste product that rapidly ages the brain. That high blood sugar of even 120, I think 120 is not very high. I can't believe how many things send my blood sugar above 120. Uh, I wanted it to be that the fructose wasn't started until like, I don't know, 180. Uh, and the first couple of papers I read, it was, well, at least at 140, there are, there's really good evidence that, that uh, glucose in, past the blood-brain barrier is now being transferred into fructose, more of a storage uh, of sugar. I mean, think of glucose in circulation as ener uh, sugar energy. Uh, think of fructose in circulation as sugar storage. And once you have so sugar storage, once you have fructose in place, your body makes uric acid. And when you look at the, uh, the neurofibril tangles or the plaques found in Alzheimer's patients, and you look under that polarized light for uric acid crystals, they're everywhere in an Alzheimer's patient, in a memory patient, a patient with dementia. This was, again, something I didn't want to look at. I didn't want to read. I didn't want that to be me. And as I watch my continuous glucose meter and what I've learned in my case is you know, even those sardines pushed my glucose up a little bit, not significantly, but boy, I shouldn't have eaten at that, that late at night. I mean, even fasting, even not feeling well, I should have found, um, I mean, if I was going to eat, I should have done it earlier. Uh, and then you saw how volatile my blood sugar got down into the 40s after I did eat because now I'm adding insulin, uh, even though it's a, a high protein, high fat was what I had. And I didn't even eat the whole can of it. I just had a couple of bites. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I could not, uh, I, I was actually really irritated <laughs> that the blood sugar went that low, but I wouldn't have known that until the next morning. So you watch that peak of blood sugar and then you watch the, the, how deep that blood pressure, that blood sugar can fall. Um, and it does uh, show you that I don't regulate my blood sugars perfectly anymore either. All right, so the point of what I was hoping you would learn on this is we had several examples today of what continuous glucose monitors do that as a physician looking for chronic disease and what happens in the metabolism when your eyeballs are closed or when your body's trying to sleep, it is impressive the amount of times I've, you know, watching a continuous glucose monitor while somebody has a stroke, watching a continuous glucose monitor at night while people have sleep apnea, studying my own as I look at, oh, I wonder what I should do next time when I'm not feeling well uh, and I'm trying to fast. I should probably not fast on that day is what I should have done. Not try to eat at uh, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. That's just not a good idea for my metabolism at my age. Uh, I, I think this uh, is one of the most powerful transferences of ownership of these chronic medical problems and how they are really uh, neon signs when I see them in patients, but that doesn't matter. It matters that the patient is able to see what is happening in their metabolism real time in a way that they only ate one pastry instead of two because they saw what it did. I hope that was informative to you. I'm going to hop over and look at some of these questions. Before I do that, I do want to make sure I touched out loud a couple of things that several of you did a great job of helping us with. Number one, we have uh, not completely been restored all the way back up on Amazon. There's a few, um, there's a few f things that are still uh, being put all the way back up on Amazon. Amazon uh, is the only place we are selling that cucumber lemon uh, BHB. It is 25% off. 
as long as Amazon has the packages. So they keep having this flutter of on and off and on and off for whether or not it's on sale. So keep an eye. It is in route. It's at some kind of distribution center, but it just isn't on the site. So we highly recommend uh, using, it's the only time I'll put 25% off on something is what's happened with that one. We just need to get that sold um, because the expiration date is somewhere in the summer. And if Amazon, if it gets too close to expiration date, then Amazon shuts down the whole um, whole kit and caboodle for all of our products, and that's a nightmare. I'm showing you the, the Dr. Boss favorites page. I've had a few of you uh, dial in to one of my pet projects, which is approved assessments. Again, as you might know, I take care of brains for a living and have for the last 20 plus years, and I look for peak brain performance. This assessment is something that I have done to every one of my patients that I want uh, before I meet them. But it's an assessment that I think should be used in places where we're bridging resources to people. Um, it's the best brain assessment out there. It is uh, the approved assessments in the, in the silos of substance abuse, in the silo of mental health, in the silo of memory health, in the silo of internal medicine. And when you look at all of those different approved assessments, it would take like six uh, professionals to get you those screenings done. We've put that into one app. We have made it extremely affordable and we are trying to partner with um, uh, uh, folks out there that who are taking care of brains and are trying to look why would the brain not be working right? Uh, what is that assessment? How well it's uh, screening and then how well it just organizes the information for the patient as well as for the provider. Uh, these are the other places where we do, uh, thankfully, make a commission uh, when you use these, uh, uh, these links. It is our affiliate link. So if you're looking for what I put in my uh, body or my family, this is where those uh, affiliate links are and it does support all the things we try to do live here on the show. Um, I think that's going to be a wrap for my announcements. Let's hop over to your questions. There's actually a question on the live, let me go to here, um, from Lisa, who was on, like, I think about an hour before we started the live. So I said, be sure to reward her and get her question to the top of the list. So uh, burning question on heat stressing. <laughs> Very good play on words there. Why do I feel so exhausted afterwards when she uh, essentially goes into the sauna? I do drink water before, during, and after the heat. Am I overdoing it? I feel the need to rest for about an hour afterwards. This uh, question, Lisa, is why I made sure to put that, that um, uh, continuous glucose monitor uh, um, uh, graph in, in the slides earlier. That when you look at that peak of glucose, um, uh, that is being mobilized during a, um, during a sauna session. Uh, you'll see that rise in glucose and then it comes right down. Uh, what I've seen, especially people who have this pretty significant exhaustion after they are under stress of heat, so sauna or maybe a hot tub is what you do. Hold on just a second. That, that, um, um, rise and fall of glucose I've had in patients with insulin resistant I've had it accompanied with a really um, a really significant wave of, of fatigue now in a normal physiologic situation where they're healthy they do not have insulin resistance they get into the sauna they're going to rise that blood sugar 20 or 30 points during that heat session when you look at that same mobilization of glucose for somebody who's been insulin resistant, I've seen it 70 or 80 points where they really have a boost of glucose. And then the glucose overshoots on the way down. Why would it do that? That's an insulin response. That's what I think is happening actually. So, and the only way I know that is what, from a continuous glucose monitor. So if you have a, you know, go in on have these with somebody and share the prescription with somebody or share the cost of these, just 10 days of watching your blood sugar and then watching what it does in a heat response. I would love to know that when you, when you're in the sauna, what's your baseline? How high did you, did those blood sugars go? Again, mobilizing that stored glucose from your muscle cells. How high did that blood glucose go? And then, uh, did it go back to baseline, like what was in the uh, picture for the one I showed the example today, or did you overshoot baseline, meaning you pushed it too low? Uh, that push too low only happens when there was a, an, a, an accompanying insulin response in that rise of glucose. 
Now, we can talk for a long time. That is pathologic. It's not supposed to happen that way, but that is one of the consequences that I see clinically with patients who've had insulin resistance for a long time. They've been overweight for a long time. They're improving. They're doing better, but uh, just like uh, that that blood sugar um, went up to over 200 when, she, when that second client ate in the evening something that was clearly high in carbohydrates. Her insulin response was excessive and an over response for what she should have done because she's been in this good phase of improving the numbers and she's getting better and she's getting better and she's getting better and boom, she ate carbs and her beta cells totally betrayed her, put out way too much insulin, and not, then she got what I would consider hypoglycemic, a drop of 100 points of her blood sugar in the next 40 minutes. So many times when I hear about that, that fatigue of um, uh, after a sauna, it can be that you've dropped your blood pressure. <laughs> it's okay, that's an easy one, but it sounds like you're drinking. Uh, I would wanna make sure that, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet, the amount of salt needed is much more than most people um, uh, really give credit for. So do not, um, do not be stingy on the salt in the ketogenic state. Where salt becomes a major issue is when they fall off the wagon, <laughs> when they start adding all those carbohydrates back and then their blood pressures soar up really high. That's when damage of their eyes and their uh, kidneys and their heart all become at risk because the pressure inside their veins is so high. All right, Lisa, I hope I answered that uh, thoroughly and in a way that you could understand. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, Penny K writes in and said, can you briefly explain the benefits of zone two training? I've been doing it twice per week on my treadmill, but I don't remember why it's good to do it. <laughs> That's a great, well, talk about a diligent student. <laughs> she, I have talked about zone two and how important that is. Uh, zone two is uh, a metric of, uh, of of a, the throttle, if you would, on how well are your mitochondria working. So we look at zone two. Zone two is referring to how much, how much, um, you know, what, yeah, I like the word throttle. What is the conversion of fuel that's running through your mitochondria and turning it into energy? Uh, zone one is our baseline. It's where we hang out, just uh, status quo. Zone two is twice that, uh, so it's pushing that lactate from a baseline of usually 1.0 to a lactate of 2.0. Uh, that is something that we can prick fingers and we can follow lactates. I, I'm actually doing a couple experiments on that in my life, uh, which I'm not ready to talk about, <laughs> but um, the better way to measure zone two is that patients are breathless, meaning the amount of fuel and energy that is being you know, pushed into the mitochondria and then energy that's you know, coming out of your powerhouse uh, is just enough that you can talk, but you don't really want to. You're breathless, you're, you're not gonna pass out, it's not, uh, you're sweating, but it's not this profuse sweating, it's a breathlessness that a lot puts you on the edge of talking, not gasping for air. Zones three and four are as you push that energy need from the body higher, uh, so they become more and more and more breathless. Uh, I think zone four, zone five, I think there's a zone five, is an all-out sprint, like the fastest, hardest you can go. Uh, so the reason you want zone two is that it is the highest turnover of your mitochondria. When you look at mitochondria, you know, people say, why do you fast every week? Well, because I want those old wimpy mitochondria to go away and I want the good mitochondria to come out to be replacing it. I want, I think I actually have a slide on this one um, for what mitochondria do or do not do. Let's go back to that slide. Bloom slides. Oh yeah, so there's mitochondria. Uh, so this mitochondria right here is a wimpy, wilted one. It's, it doesn't have a lot of folds in it. Can you see the little cracks there in that mitochondria? Uh, and as fuel flows down that mitochondria, uh, it turns into energy. And if it's a perfectly healthy, wonderful mitochondria, it doesn't waste energy. But this one is not so perfect. As the Krebs cycle or the energy cycle takes fuel, it leaks out energy. And this is where our cells age. This is where our cells um, really do have more free radicals being produced than you're using. And, and we want those old mitochondria to go away. The way you get them to go away is you spend 70 to 80% of your workout time in zone two, which is the highest turnover of getting those broken mitochondria to turn into those perfectly wonderful mitochondria. So mitophagy, turnover of mitochondria. So keep up the good work. Zone two is 
I think it's boring. <laughs> so I have a tough time staying in zone two because I'm like, oh, let's just push it. Um, I do a better job of staying in zone two with sauna, actually. <laughs> All right, let's do a couple more questions. Michael writes in and says, I have triple digit glucose almost every morning, 100 to 115. I'm having two meals per day, an excellent diet, exercising, no snacks, no cheating. Do I need to live on the edge of starvation? No, 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 no. So this is absolutely why I wrote the book Keto Continuum, that uh, the previous version of getting people to lose weight was well, it was what you just wrote about. It was showing them how to starve themselves. And then every day they, they didn't starve themselves, they would slide backwards by a week. So that mistake that the, the client made where should they overate, if they weren't in a ketogenic state, that mistake would cost them weeks, or at least, at least a week before they would really get back to a calorie deficit again, or a, a place where energy expenditure is less um, um, than a weight loss would happen. When you are trying to, to, use, to lose weight on a ketogenic diet and you've been insulin resistant, like the patient that, um, the, that had the high blood sugar, that still blood sugars are 120 in the morning, uh, number one most important thing that that patient should do is to add fasting. I mean, she's metabolically uh, flexible. She's been making ketones for a while. Her body is in shape. She now needs to take the threshold to the, uh, the next level and have the absence of calories uh, for an extended period of time because there's so much storage in her body that her triple digit sugars are staying there. What I often see people do is they'll try to copy what I'm doing. They'll have a 36 hour fast or a 48 hour fast and then well, what's not on camera here is what I do on these off days, where my eating window is uh, usually that, you know, four hours. Uh, I try to have a high pro protein, high fat. I try not to put calories in after 5.30 at night. Um, if I do, I try to really fast for 36 hours after that because I can't afford that. My metabolism isn't that good. Um, having uh, energy expenditure in the form of sweating, uh, either through sauna or through a, a, a workout, is how I will undo a deficit where if I do eat late at night, if I have an event that took me out at night. So when I see patients do that and they're, they're not, their morning fasting sugars are not in the two digits, they're not at 70 or 80, uh, that weekly fasting of no calories for that 60 to 72 hours, it makes all the difference. If somebody who's stuck in the cycle of not getting those triple digits um, uh, you know, always having triple digit sugars in the morning, um, you're aging that process, you're making that uric acid in their brain, you are, um, you know, marching towards the dementia. So you're like, well, how do I stop it? How do I stop it? That is what the book Keto Continuum is all about. It's the stepwise process. We do that. Um, I've had many people write in and say, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I said, I bet you. Um, and that bet usually shows up in the 21 day metabolic kick where it's a three week live course. We walk patients and people through this story. Uh, our coaches are real live people who struggle with their health, who are using a ketogenic journey to reverse their medical problems. And uh, just, we you know, finished that up in the month of February. We do it in you know, late January, early February, and we do it right after Labor Day. Uh, two, two seasons where we think folks really can push reset in a way that's uh, meaningful. And when we look at over 200 students at one time, all getting their glucoses down to that double digits in the morning and ketones that are really robust, it's a true metabolic kick when, they, when we do that. So uh, Michael, I, I spend a little extra time answering that because I know it can be very frustrating. Um, when I have you know, helped many people in this situation, what's the hardest is I wish they could see what I see. Uh, I've seen this problem hundreds of times, thousands of times, and it is only when they are able to really wring out that excessive amount of glucose uh, in a way that has a far forward marching plan, um, it's not a subtle change in eating. And then the starvation, it, that is not the answer either. The starvation turns into a metabolic shutdown, and then they really have trouble losing weight. Um, can one eat too much salt? <laughs> I have salt in my mouth almost all the time. So salt is, it's a, it's a really good question because it's got a two-pronged answer. Uh, 
if you're not in a ketogenic state, if you've got a metabolism that isn't producing ketones and really dropping that blood sugar, keeping that flatline blood sugar on your continuous glucose monitor, um, <clears throat> you shouldn't be having excessive amount of salts. It'll send you know, carbohydrates plus salt, send that blood pressure up. That's where we end up with uh, increased risk for heart disease in a, um, and high blood pressure. When I look up people at a ketogenic state, I'm on a ketogenic state, I, I can't believe how much salt I need to take in or I, um, I get lightheaded. So the, the salt is relative to the consumption of fluid. I really do trust patients when it comes to salt intake and um, salt and water intake when they're in a ketogenic state. I try not to give them all that freedom when, they're, when their carbohydrates are a high consumption because they can't feel the high blood pressure. Their pressure is high because they've got carbohydrates, salt together, now we've got a mess. We've got a risk for heart disease. When they're in a ketogenic state, when they're living a, a you know, in nutritional ketosis, um, that blood sugar is stable, it's not volatile. Uh, volatile blood sugars turn into um, salt sensitive uh, kidneys and that's where they will wind that blood pressure up they will cause damage to their end organs of kidneys eyes and heart without even knowing it so can you eat too much salt if you're in a persistent ketogenic state and you have salt and uh, water to the point where you don't feel constantly thirsty that's where uh, the sweet spot is it's amazing to me how much salt that I need um, now prior to uh, I would never add salt to things before I started the ketogenic journey. So the answer is that it's a unique, uh, unique to people in what setting their chemistry is in. All right, let's do a couple more questions. Uh, we have Think For Yourself writes in and says, what would cause blood sugar to spike only slightly after protein, but ketones to drop? What would cause blood sugar to go up after protein, but ketones drop? Oh, that, so that, that's normal. <laughs> So when you're, when, when I take in sardines, uh, this is a great question actually. Uh, when I take in sardines, my blood sugar doesn't go up much, but my ketones drop. Uh, that is that when your body eats food, even, even high protein, high fat, that chewing, that mastication, that, uh, that stimulates an endocrine response. And the number one endocrine response that you're gonna make because you've been overweight in the past, at least most people that watch this channel have been overweight in the past, is insulin. That insulin production stops ketones, okay? Stops ketone production. So when you spike up that insulin, it's, a, the, it's the on off switch for ketone production. Insulin secretion or insulin goes up, ketones go down. And you say, but my blood sugar only went up by a little bit. I'm like, yes, but the production of insulin is an endocrine response from chewing. It is the reason why I am so adamant that you should really only be putting in boluses of food. I try not to call them snacks or meals or this or that because people play games. I'm saying there should be food going down the gullet two times in an adult's day. This pocket of time and this pocket of time because the bolus of food stimulates an endocrine response when you chew it and swallow it. And that is a, such a common mistake that I see patients make. They say, why won't my sugars go down? I only had a few macadamia nuts before bed. I'm like, you don't get to have macadamia nuts before bed. You've been producing excessive amounts of insulin for the last 30 years. You are overproducing insulin. You're gonna shut down that ketone production. You're gonna get hungry and not feel good because of that endocrine response. Uh, even when you only have a you know couple bites of a sardine last night like I did. Uh, so that's a really common response and the answer is that's normal for anybody who's been insulin resistant. Okay, let's see. Wow, we have about five left, but I'm only gonna do a couple I can hear. I don't know if you can hear it. My voice getting a little scratchy here again. Um, all right, Karen S says, do you need to avoid the sauna when wearing a CGM? No, I wear my sauna, wear my CGM in the sauna. Uh, do you feel better when sugar is high? Why do I feel so much better when sugar is high? <coughs> <coughs> uh, so, oh, Sharon, I have really good slides for this. I wish I would have prepared them. All right, so I don't know if you remember me talking about this at the beginning of the show where I said that insulin resistance, uh, so we're, we're the, the client who had the higher blood sugars and then she peaked them at, at midnight, um, her blood sugars are lower than they were a month ago. 
okay? She's in a ketogenic state, she's got her eating window, she's doing a good job most days. I showed you the day where she didn't do so, you know, she made a mistake. Uh, but most days that blood sugar is lower. As that blood sugar lowered because she's eating a ketogenic way of life, uh, the circulating blood sugar is lower, which therefore s decreases the insulin. It takes, you know, I, the example I use is it takes five units of insulin to, to bind to this cell so that the glucose can enter the cell. But now your body only has three units of insulin, so the sugar can't get in. You are insulin resistant. That cell is starving on the inside. The glucose is on the outside. The cell is on the inside. It's only when you have a burst of sugar that produces a burst of insulin and now all five parking spots of that, sh of that cell are insulin filled and the glucose can get inside the cell so your cells feel happy. But unfortunately, you just went backwards. Insulin resistance is lowering the, um, the need for so much insulin. And the only way that you lower the need for insulin is the persistent stable uh, blood sugars day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. And when you have a little hiccup like our client did where they have carbohydrates in the afternoon or evening, uh, that burst of glucose, will, it will set her back. Now, it won't set her back as much as uh, eating on a low calorie diet used to, but it's gonna be a couple days before those sugars stabilize back into that stable level. And if she wants the fastest return back to that, it's gonna be with uh, you know, an exercise of her cells, maybe um, a sauna, maybe the, uh, a workout that really breaks a sweat, um, or, she has to just return back to the stable, mable, st steady as you go, do not, uh, do, and just boring, boring eating patterns. No eating late at night, no eating after sunset. If I, if I was advising this patient saying, hey, here's where you're gonna screw it up. So when people have that high blood sugar, it takes them back to the chapter that they were just at, meaning a whole bunch of insulin showed up, now the glucose can get into the cell, and their cell feels happy and they're like, woo, I feel better. But that's not the life that, I mean, that that's promoting the insulin resistance. I'm gonna call that a night, you guys. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in and I will uh, see you next.